can't, I can't wait to get back and uh, have a go at John Wright. I wasn't expecting this one. Anyway, brachial plexus examination. The aim of any brachial plexus examination is to determine the level of the lesion, the extent of the lesion, and its severity. Now, if you do this in a clinical setting, you may be able to decide management, a plan for rehab, and possibly a prognosis for the patient. But possibly for the vast majority of you in this audience, what you want to do is do the brachial plexus examination and pass the exam. And I think if you give a reasonable judgment on these three variables, you probably do that with flying colours. Okay. But there are requirements even before you approach the patient. And there's no doubt, unfortunately, you need to know the brachial plexus inside out. You need to know about the roots. You need to know about the dorsal scapular nerve that comes off the C5 nerve root. You need to know that the long thoracic nerve comes off C5, C6, C7. That the supraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve that's the only nerve that comes off the superior trunk. You need to know the branches that come off the cords, the thoracodorsal from the posterior cords, the medial and lateral pectoral nerves from the respective cords. If you know this and put it into action, you'll have a much clearer idea as to the level of the lesion. We need to know how to assess the muscle groups innervated by the nerve roots. What's that called? It's called the myotomes, okay? So you need to know about the myotomes of the upper limb. How to assess the C5 myotome? Simply shoulder abduction. The C6 myotome. This includes ECRB and ECRL, so that wrist dorsiflexion in radial deviation would be a good way of assessing C6, as is biceps. Just be careful, there is a component of biceps innervated by the C5 nerve root that can be misleading. C7, you can test finger extensors, wrist flexion, and of course triceps. C8, the long flexors of the fingers. And you, you see here a little aid memoir to help you. And then T1, as we've mentioned before, the intrinsic muscles of the hand. We need to know the sensory area supplied by those roots, the dermatomes. C5 over the shoulder, C6, radial border of the hand, not just on the palmar aspect, which could be median nerve, but also, also dorsally. C7, middle finger, C8, on the border of the hand, coming up to the elbow, T1, above, and T2 in the axilla. We need to be able to assess all the terminal branches, either their motor component, their sensory component, or both. Particularly the ones that affect the shoulder girdle. Okay, which are those? From the back, we can assess the rhomboids, which are innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. We can assess serratus anterior, innervated by the long thoracic nerve. And we add to that trapezius. We add, to, we add trapezius because it can also be involved in the same injury that led to that brachial plexus injury. Spinal accessory nerve may be damaged. From the front, uh, Mr. Shahani was very clear as to how to assess the suprascapular nerve with supraspinatus. And then we can also assess pectoralis major for the medial and lateral pectoral nerves, latissimus dorsi for the thoracodorsal nerve, and then we can look at the delta again with a view to assessing the axillary nerve. Okay. 
This diagram is a little bit more complex than the dermatomes, but certainly you should have it in the back of your head because if it's not a nerve root but a terminal branch problem, then this might be the pattern of sensory loss. We need to know about the possible level of injuries. We've got supracavicular injuries involving the roots and the trunks. With the roots, it could be a preganglionic or postganglionic lesion. With infraclavicular injuries, which tend to be iatrogenic, the surgeon's knife, the anesthetist's needle, this tends to affect the cords and the branches. Preganglionic lesions are very important. You don't want to miss one either in the clinical setting or in the exam. They give rise to a very painful anesthetic arm, tends to be flail because of the paralysis of the scapular muscles. They may even have long track signs because the nerve roots have been avulsed and the cords have been damaged. And of course, they may have Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome, ptosis, meiosis, enophthalmos, sunken eye, and anhydrosis, dry skin. With all these prerequisites, what we need to now do is put it into a systematic approach that will make it far easier for you to remember in the exam situation or even in the clinic. Okay, so how do we go about assessing the brachial plexus? Look, feel, move. Look, almost immediately, see whether the patient can stand what their gait's like. If they have long track signs, they may have difficulties with these. Use your powers of observation. Is there a walking stick next to them? Look for wasting, the pattern of wasting. In this case, it seems that the whole arm is wasted. Okay? You can look at the position of the arm because there's some well-known typical injuries. For example, the herbs palsy, where the shoulder is adducted there's internal rotation of the shoulder, extension of the elbow, and the flexed wrist. Typical of a C5, C6 nerve root injury. Clump keys. Okay. Wasting of the T1 myotome gives you this appearance of the simian hand. And you can also see again once more that we've discussed earlier intrinsic minus with clawing of all the fingers. Don't forget to look, again Mr. Shahani mentioned this, in the axilla. Okay? There may be a scar in the axilla from surgery that led to the injury. And finally, before you move away from the looking part, make a point of not missing that Horner syndrome. The last part of a Horner syndrome, anhydrosis, loss of sweating on that side of the face, may lead you on to the next part of the examination, which is to feel. And you can continue feeling by looking for any tenderness over any bony areas. There may have been a clavicular fracture, a shoulder injury. You then feel for a sensation, whether it's a dermatomal distribution or a cutaneous nerve supply. This might be patchy, so don't jump to any conclusions just yet with regards to where the lesion is. Just put that to the back of your mind. And finally, before you move on, the last part of feeling may be to feel for a pulse. Because if they have no pulse, there may have been, there may have been an injury to the subclavian artery. So feel. And then move. And this has to be the most systematic approach to this. So we start with the nerve roots. C5, shoulder abduction. C6, I'll do wrist extension in radial deviation. C7, finger extens extensors or triceps. C8, long flexors. T1, abduction. One by one, 
methodically we carry out those tests. We then move to the next part of the brachial plexus. Sorry, I just jumped one. Dorsal scapula. Okay, shoulder retraction. Look at the rhomboids, feel the rhomboids if necessary. Long thoracic nerve. Hands against the wall, okay, looking for winging of the scapula. While we're at the back, assess trapezius. Moving on to that one branch that comes off uh, the trunks, the suprascapular nerve, we're going to assess supraspinatus. As Mr. Shahani demonstrated, 45 degrees, press on the forearm, not on the forearm, is it? Press on the arms, above the elbow, not below the elbow. Gosh, that's something I learned today. Okay. Carrying on to the cords, lateral pectoral nerve, medial pectoral nerve, hands by the sides, press down, feel for pectoralis major. Thoracodorsal arm, get the patient to put their arm on top of the shoulder for them to press down and feel at the back. Okay, and that will test the thoracodorsal nerve and latissimus dorsi. And then, by that stage, you would have picked up the deficiencies. And by putting your sensory loss and your muscle problems together should give you an idea as to the level of the injury, the extent and its severity. If you've not picked something up by then, then you might be looking at a more peripheral injury and that's things that obviously Mr. Sh and Mr. Ali's discussed. Okay. We've all got to be aware that we're not expecting miracles, that even in the best of hands, the accuracy of brachial plex examination may only be about 60%. So don't panic. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so I think um, we would have gone through all, all, all the theoretical part. The, the, the lectures are related to, to today, so um, uh, hopefully over lunch you can think about it and assimilate it and then uh, put it into practice by uh, coming into groups this afternoon. What we propose to do is at every station we'll just do a, a demonstration of what we told you. Uh, and then, then for a few minutes you can practice on each other to, 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 to seal things. Uh, so my p plan, I think, is if you guys go, go for lunch, have lunch, and if you uh, maybe come back about 10 minutes early, say 20, 20, 20 past, 20 past, sorry, no, what are we? So it's 10 to 1, uh, then, then, then we, we'll have the papers where you can set, put yourself into groups, and then we'll, we'll have a system worked out to get you around. Okay.